2 Timothy chapter number 4, we continue in our look verse by verse through our Apostle Paul's book of 2 Timothy. And as we, uh, as I want to remind you, sometimes this will be the first study that someone here might have heard me uh, teach on this, or someone on the internet. 2 Timothy is Paul's last will and testament. It's the last book that Paul writes before he dies under the Roman Empire, uh, under Nero in particular. Uh, Paul wants to instruct Timothy, not only to instruct Timothy, but um, encourage Timothy to hold on to the mystery of Christ, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of mystery. Even by the time Paul was about to die, there in late 60s AD, the, the, the truth of God's rightly divided word was starting to uh, be thrown away. Only a few people, uh, if you look, look at 2 Timothy chapter number 1, 2 Timothy chapter number 1, I'm going to read a verse and then uh, we'll have a word of prayer. But notice what happened even in the days of Paul. Look at verse number 15. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15. <clears throat> this thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia, and that's that territory where Ephesus was, what we call modern day Turkey, Asia Minor, all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your holy word. We thank you for the holy scriptures. Uh, we thank you for the word of God made flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to earth, lived a perfect life under your righteous law in Israel, and then died on that cruel and criminal cross for our sins. Father, we thank you for his sacrifice on Calvary's cross, how his precious shed blood, his innocent blood, is sufficient, more than sufficient, to pay for all of our sins, and, and that you give us that great gift of salvation, full and free, by grace through faith plus no works. That's how we're saved today, Father. It's faith plus nothing. So we thank you for the, the salvation that is in Christ. But Father, we thank you for his resurrection, that life given to us, that not only can we have everlasting life as a free gift, but we can have the very life of the Lord Jesus Christ manifest in our mortal bodies, Father, as we study your word, rightly divided, as well as by the Spirit of God working in us whom believe, who, who believe. So we thank you for the Holy Scriptures which we're gonna study today. We ask that you give us great insight, wisdom, and understanding. And most importantly, Father, we ask that you give us a greater appreciation of your Son, your Holy Son, our precious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. As you can see, as Paul's last will and testament, which is the most important words a man would give, is, is he, he wasn't on his deathbed, but he was definitely uh, in his death chamber. He was in a, in a prison in Rome. And he's giving these words to Timothy, who's going to carry on in ministry. If you go back to 2 Timothy chapter number 4, Paul is going to end the book by talking about a most important subject that he can, and that's the Lord, the righteous judge. If you look with me at verse number 6, look at 2 Timothy 4 verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered. Paul saw himself as a living sacrifice, and now he was going to die for the truth. He was going to be martyred. And the time of my departure is at hand. Last week we saw that when you die, it is a soul that departs. Genesis 35, when Rachel was dying, as she gave birth to Benjamin, it says her soul was a departing. And just like you come in connected to an umbilical cord, you come into life that has to be cut. Well, death, Solomon says there's that, that silver cord is broken in death. That's why people, we saw that when people have these out-of-body experiences near death, and they could see the doctors and nurses working on them because their soul is departing, but they, they're brought back. That's what's going on until that it's cut. Well, Paul says his departure, his soul is going to depart. In, in, in Philippians, he says to depart and to be with Christ is far better. He's talking about dying. And the time of his departure, just like a plane takes off, Paul's soul is going to take off at his death. Most likely he was, as a Roman citizen, he was a Jew who uh, Jews in Rome would normally, let me say it like this, the Roman government would normally crucify Jews like they did the Lord. But because Paul was a Roman citizen, his execution was most likely a beheading, okay? They put the black bag on him and chop him off, and he's with the Lord. Well, his, his time of that was at hand. Verse 7. Now, remember, we saw that only Paul could say verse 7. Nobody knows when their course is, is ended. It, well, when you die or the rapture, then you know your course is finished. Well, maybe not finished if you die, depending on. Anyway, Paul could say that as a, because the Lord told him. Look at verse 7. I have fought a good fight. He fought that good fight. 
I have finished my course. He talks about in Acts 20, verse 24, talk about the, the, to finish his course in the ministry which we received of the Lord to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He says in verse 7, I have kept the faith. The faith is that faith of Jesus Christ, the mystery. Now, because he finished all of that, he did what the Lord wanted him to do. He served the Lord. Guess what happens next? Look at verse 8. Henceforth, from that moment on, there is what? Laid up for me. And last week's message was about that crown of righteousness. We saw that that crown of righteousness, it, 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 equ it equates to that crown of faith and love. Do you have faith in the Lord Jesus? Do you believe his message called the mystery? Well, yes. Well, do you show it by serving the saints with your time, your talent, your treasures? Well, if, you could, if you're doing that, then you're going to get that crown of righteousness. And when he talks about a crown, that means you're going to reign with Christ. Go back to chapter 2 of 2 Timothy. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 12, 2 Timothy 2, 12. If we suffer, we shall also, what, reign with him. God created the body of Christ for the heavenly places. God created the nation of Israel to, to rule and reign on the earth. Jesus Christ, our Lord, will return, set up his earthly kingdom, and the nation of Israel will rule and reign over all the Gentile nations. But God, what's the first verse of your Bible? In the beginning, God created the what? Heaven. Heaven. Genesis 1.1 sets the tone for, for the entire scripture. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth. The second verse says, and the earth. And God just dealt with the earth all through prophecy. When he talks about prophecy, the things that God has made known out of the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. He was quiet about the heavens. He kept a secret about the heavens. That's right. Prophecy went all the way through here until you get to Acts chapter nine and the apostle Paul. Saul is his Hebrew name. And when the Lord Jesus Christ came back from heaven's glory in Acts nine, save Saul of Tarsus, the apostle Paul, he gave him the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. This secret information for the heavenly places. And it wasn't until the apostle Paul that we know what God's doing in the heavenly place. And that's the body of Christ, the body of Christ. Those of us who are saved today in the dispensation of grace, we're going to serve God in the heavens where the nation of Israel, the seed of Abraham, the Hebrews, they're going to serve God on the earth. And God's going to have his reign and his kingdom, king's dominion, king's domain in the heavens through the body of Christ. That's why we're raptured out of here. We're going to go up. We go up and we serve the Lord in the heavenly places. Israel, when Christ comes back in the second coming, out here after the tribulation period and so forth, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come up and set up his kingdom, the earthly kingdom. That's why they pray, thy kingdom come. No grace believer today has to pray, thy kingdom come. We say, Lord, come and take us up. We want to go up. We're taking up. Well, it, the Lord, after the rapture, is going to have about a, probably about a 10-year period where he does the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to look at that today. The judgment seat of Christ. People don't talk about this enough, do they? This judgment seat of Christ is what motivates or should motivate you to serve the Lord. That's 10 is the number associated with judgment. So it'll probably be about 10 years. Down here is going to be total chaos on the earth, especially in the Middle East. You can see that the stage is being set. The Middle East is a mess. Well, during that time, it's going to be a transition period in the earth. Uh, the Antichrist is going to come to power and so forth. Then you're going to have the start of the 70th week of Daniel. The seven year tri uh, tribulation or great tribulation to last. The time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, that's Israel. Well, the point is, do, before that seven year period starts, there's a little transition from the rapture to the, second to, the, to, the, to, the, to the 70th week. My point is, that's what's going to happen up here, the judgment seat of Christ. Now, look what he calls it. Look at verse 8 again. Verse eight, henceforth, there is laid up for me. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Um, go, go back to Second Timothy two. I had you over there in verse 12. Let me let me let me finish that. If we suffer, we shall also what reign with him. There's going to be a group of members of the body of Christ who suffer with him. Who are going to reign with him. Look at the rest of the verse. If we deny him, he also will deny us. In that verse, it says, if we suffer, we shall reign if we deny him, he would deny us. What will he deny us? 
The what? Inadver the reigning. So not every member of the body of Christ, although we're all destined for the heavenly places, not every member will reign with him. It is the judgment seat of Christ where the Lord Jesus determines who will reign with him or not. Now, there is a qualifier. You must suffer with him. Look at chapter three. Look at Second Timothy, chapter three. Verse 12. Second Timothy three, verse 12. Yea. All that will. This is a this is a choice you make. Live godly, and that's going to be through the doctrine, which is according to godliness, Paul calls it. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer what? Persecution. Now, you see that issue of Christ Jesus. He didn't just call him Jesus Christ. When Paul uses that term Christ Jesus, when he reverses that, the focus is on his Christ has to do with his suffering. And then the glory that shall be revealed in him. So when you see Paul put Christ before Jesus, sometimes he'll say Jesus Christ. A lot of times he just says Christ. Sometimes he says Jesus about his humanity. We're going to talk about that. Look at him. Dodie's right on it. Today we're going to talk about why he calls him sometimes, sometimes call him Lord. But before we do, go, go over to Romans chapter 8. Let me show you about this issue of suffering with Christ. Because when you suffer with Christ, that's, that's what it takes to reign with Christ. And what this suffering is, how Jesus Christ suffers today, it's not a physical suffering. No one's beating on our Lord. He's right there at the right hand of the Father. All the beating was done at Calvary. The Romans beat him up. They crucified him. We saw those crown of thorns when we looked at our study on crowns last week. These thorns weren't the little thorns that are on the rose that Adam brought. No, no, no. Over there in the Middle East, these large thorns. They were able to craft a crown and put it on his head, the Roman soldiers. He was bleeding to death. Well, he was bleeding. He was the only one who could dismiss his spirit, by the way. He was right. He was innocent. He was pure. He was impeccable. He had no sin. Therefore, he could not die. He had to dismiss his spirit. He'd still be there if he wanted to. Father, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. He sent it out there because he was he, death had no dominion over him. OK. All right. Now, look at Romans chapter number eight. Romans eight. Look at verse number 17, Romans 8, 17. And if children, speaking of children of God, then heirs. All right. So when you get saved today through the blood of Christ, when you get saved through the, through the cross and you listen to Paul's gospel of grace. When you get saved by the gospel of grace. You become an, a child of God which makes you because our father has an inheritance it makes you an heir of god you inherit the heavenly places you inherit a new glorious body like his philippians 3. at the rapture we shall all be changed <coughs> the ones who are still here uh we're going to get new bodies new glorious bodies okay like unto his philippians 3. so god has promised you you're going to go to heaven. You know what? No man ever looked to go to heaven before the Apostle Paul. The, Jew, the Jews of time past, when they died, they slept with their fathers. They went down to paradise. To Abraham's bosom it was called as far as uh, the, 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 what, what, what they call it, the vernacular. But it's paradise, the heart of the earth. Jesus tells the thief on the cross, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. In the heart, that's the heart of the earth. It's not until the Apostle Paul... Where a man now says, if I die in Christ, I'm going to go up to heaven. Nobody before Paul ever preached that you die and went to heaven. Not at all. Well, you are an heir of God if you're going to say, look at verse 17. And if children, then heirs. Now notice, heirs of God, God's the, God the Father, heirs of God. That's the book of Ephesians. We're blessed with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. He, he, he gives us part of his inheritance. But look at the rest of that verse. And that's addition to joint heirs, equal heirs with, did it say Jesus? No. no. Did it say the Lord? No. It says Christ. Because there is a qualifier on being a joint heir. The rest of the verse tells you, if so be. That's conditional. If so be that we what? Suffer with him. 
that we may also be glorified together. When he's coronated king of the heavenly places, that's a future event. Just like when he comes, we're about to have the presidential inauguration in our country this Friday. It's a big deal when the powers change over a new administration. They put on a big thing, right, in Washington, D.C. Well, if man can do that, get in your mind. That happens every four years here. What's going to happen is, let me go future to the second coming. There's going to be a coronation of Jesus as king on this earth. King of kings, Lord of lords on the earth. But before that, in the heavenly places, after the judgment seat of Christ, and he hands the body of Christ now clean of all sins and a blemish and so forth, the Ephesians says, we're going to go before God the Father, and he's going to coronate the Lord Jesus. But there's going to be a group of people who have a crown of righteousness with them. The joint heirs with Christ. Look at that verse. And joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. When the Lord, when God the Father coronates the Lord Jesus out here in the future, when he designates him ruler of the heavens, people think that he is that now. Technically he is, but there is a rain delay. I played baseball. This is Ryan. I played baseball. and You're all ready to go, right? But the weather in the Midwest in Chicago is not too good. So you're out there and it's raining. You know what the umpires do? Time out. Bring the tarp. We sit in the dugout like some goose for an hour. All right, it's going to be another hour. We go in the clubhouse. Four hours later, they're asking us to play ball. The stands are clear. Ain't nobody out there. Okay. <laughs> rain delay. But that's R-A-I-N. There is a rain delay with the Lord Jesus in the heavens on, on the earth. When he says in Matthew 28, after his resurrection, all power is given unto me in heaven and the earth. Have you seen this world we live in? Is Jesus our Lord running this earth? Mm -hmm. The God of this world, the little G, Satan is running this world, but Satan is still up there too. Revelation says he gets kicked out in the middle of that seven year period. But until then, he's, he, the, the heavens are unclean in his sight, Joe said. So when the judgment seat of Christ is done and he has his joint heirs and the rest of the body of Christ, I mean, they said that the new administration, you, you understand his cabinet. So he's going through, he, he is nominating cabinets. They got to go through Senate, approving all this other stuff. But it says the president, he has 4,000 plus jobs he has to appoint. We see the cabinet, his inner circle, those who are going to be right in the White House, his joint, you know, talking with him every day. But he has to, uh, federal judges, uh, little, just all these different things you don't think about. Well, the body of Christ is that way. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to have his joint heirs reigning. But every member of the body of Christ will have a job. Not all going to reign, just like not every American is a government official. The founding fathers actually meant for that rotation of regular citizens. You know that? They, didn't, they, they would never guess somebody would be 50 years as a congressman living off the people. You're supposed to get in there six years, maybe a secretary and get out and somebody else. They wanted regular people so it can stay fresh. These people in, in Washington, they take advantage of all of us, you know. But the Lord Jesus has a joint heirs who are going to reign with him. But he has a part for everyone. Go over to Ephesians on the way back. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. <laughs> Ephesians chapter number 1. Because not every, by the way. If so be that we suffer with him. If we suffer, we shall reign. How can you suffer with the Lord? The question is, how does Jesus Christ suffer today? Nobody's beating up on him. The Romans aren't placing crowns of thorns on him anymore. No, no, no. We saw last time when he comes, he's going to come with many crowns, and they're not going to be crowns of thorns. Crowns of gold, silver, precious stones, and so forth. Well, look at Ephesians chapter number 1. Verse 21, speaking of when he raised the Lord Jesus Christ, what he has in store for him. Verse 20, start at verse 20. Talk about his resurrection power. Ephesians 1.20, speaking of that power, which he wrought in Christ. Now, as a student of the word, when Paul uses that, when he wrought in Christ, he didn't say Jesus, he didn't say the Lord. When Paul says in Ephesians, he wrought in Christ, when you see him use that word Christ, what should your mind think of? The suffering, that's right. Jesus Christ, Jesus died on that cross. He suffered for this privilege. He suffered. He sacrificed. All right, keep going. Verse 20, which he wrought in Christ 
when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion. Those are all those different levels of authority in the heavenly places of reigning and ruling, making policy. But just because Ephesians shows God's love to the entire body, to all the heirs, I love how Paul just puts this little bit at the end. Look at verse 20, uh, verse 21. After dominion and every name that is named. That term, every name that is named, that's all the heirs of God. He just says every name that is named. That's short for the heirs of God. Every member of the body of Christ. All of our brothers and sisters in Christ and denominations who reject the truth of God's grace. My, my man wrote this letter. If he's sharing this with saved members of the body of Christ and it goes over as well as a pork chop sandwich in a temple, like he said, they reject, they refuse to believe the mystery of Christ given to Paul. They're still saved because their salvation is by grace through faith plus what? No works. They have eternal security, everlasting life. God will never change that. They're saved. But they're heirs of God and not joint heirs with Christ. They won't reign with him, but they will have a position in the heavenly places. Look at just like everybody in our nation doesn't run the government, but we all have jobs to do to keep things going. Same with the body of Christ. That thing where he says every name that is named, that's the rest of the body of Christ who won't reign. OK. Now, Jesus Christ suffers today because his truth is what? Rejected. He suffers rejection. And when you hand out to others the mystery of Christ, I've been preaching it for 20 years. When you talk about the mystery of Christ, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, Paul's pre presentation of Jesus, which was kept secret, most of the denomination brother, brothers and sisters will reject it and you. Just start putting that stuff out there. Why, why don't we have a, a thousand member church? Because most members of the body of Christ reject this truth. They still are saved. They're still heirs of God, but they won't reign with Christ. They're not joint heirs with Christ because they refuse to suffer with him. Go back to 2 Timothy 2. Look at that. 2 Timothy 2. They refuse to suffer with him. 2 Timothy 2.12. If we suffer... We shall also reign with him. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter number one, he says in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them who should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. The way the Lord Jesus suffers today is it's in the mystery of Christ. He suffers rejection by his own people. But that shouldn't marvel you because wasn't Israel his people? And you know what they did? Did they receive their Messiah? No. They, they killed him through the hands of Romans on a cruel and criminal cross for no reason, but they just they didn't believe him. Yeah, it was it was ridiculous. They rejected the, the son of the uh, of God, the father. All right. Now go back to chapter number four. Our title is the righteous judge. Now look at verse eight. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord. Now, this is not really taught. This is not taught in churches. I, I'll be honest with you. I've never heard it taught in my time. Check this out. Satan, man, he, ooh, Satan is a, he's a subtle little rascal. We need to take him serious. Not more serious than the Lord, obviously, but don't, don't, listen here. He's subtle, okay? And two things aren't taught much. What? Thank you. No I. Huh? No I. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I spell it like you do in the hood. <laughs> we just spell it like it sounds. <laughs> that's right. What what'd you, what'd you say, Larry? That's right. That's right. I call it Ebonics. That's, that, that is from the hood. My little daughter does that. She just spell a word the way it sounds. Sorry about that. You know what I was, I, I, you know what I was trying to spell? Uh, Second Corinthians 11. He's, yeah, I was trying. I, I had both of them in my mind uh, as, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So I, I mixed them up. But yeah, he's subtle. 
my mind was thinking about the verse Second Timothy. Uh, like an, old, Second an old school way of spelling, kind of like how the King James does S H E W for show. Oh yeah. 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 When you do that, we had a guy study to show thyself approved unto God. This guy Lewis, he was he would always say study to shoe thyself, and we'd be cracking up. Yeah, but it, it is it is true. It's they're subtle and sub and subtle with an I in mm -hmm. King James. I've even heard people pronounce it subtility. Oh, know. okay. I don't know who knows, you know, but it's weird. A, a lot of these old Elizabethan King James words, like labor. Anytime I write a, a, a email and I spell it the way the Bible does, the thing tells me I'm spelling it wrong. <laughs> I said, no, they say they keep changing. I said, no, I want it the way the Bible. You know. Or like heretic without a K. Exactly, without a K. Yeah. So two things, these two things, the judge, okay, give me, a, give me a minute. By the way, some people spell judgment, J-U-D-G-E. Uh, mm -hmm. Some spell it without the E, right? Okay, so the judgment seat of Christ. Now, these two things, our subtle adversary either hides from the believers or waters down mm -hmm. because this term Lord we hear this growing up all the time Lord 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 but look what Paul says the meaning of the word is look at this verse verse number eight henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord the what righteous judge shall give me at that day and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Let me show you something. The righteous judge. When we talk about the Lord, when, more importantly, when Paul talks about it, he wants you to focus on these three things. He's the, means the only, righteous as opposed to the unjust, judge, which means he's going to bring judgment. Let me show you something. Go to, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul is going to deal with judgment. When we, when we get to the heavenly places, the body of Christ is going to, to do some judgment, some judging, particularly at the great white throne. Uh, Denise, we were talking about that. The great white throne is where the body of Christ will sit in judgment to sentence all those who were lost over through, uh, through the ages. Okay, That's at the end of the thousand years. But let me show you something. Look at chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians. I love the fact it starts with a dare. Yet when you're younger, you say, you say, I dare you to do something. There's some peril there, right? I dare you to do it. Paul says, dare any of you. How dare you? Think about what he's going to say. How dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? He's saying there were saints there who had a matter. And instead of bringing it before a council of brothers in Christ, they decided to go to civil to the law to the, to the law. Judge Judy. Yeah, like to judge Judy <laughs> and let some lost person in the affairs of two saved person. Paul says, how dare you? And he calls them the law before the unjust. Righteousness means ju uh, just. Unjust is the opposite of righteous because there is not a justice system in our country in particular. You know, you ever heard somebody talk about the justice system? I laugh because there's a Department of Justice. I crack up. I tell Krista, I call it the, the DOI, the Department of Injustice, because it's all political. There's no justice system. There's a legal system. Paul calls it an unjust system. It's unjust. It is. Unjust it's in. Justice. Listen, justice look what he says here. Verse two. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world be judged by you, you saints, are ye unworthy? To, he says, God's going to use us, saints, the body, to judge the entire world. That's going to be the, the, the great white throne. If we're going to be doing that, why can't we judge the, well, these little things, small matters? Verse 3, know ye not that we shall judge angels? I mean, God's going to put us into the into the position of judging the, the very angels that have fallen and so forth. And we're going we're gonna to determine their sentence based upon their crimes. He's saying if he's going to have us do things for the earth as well as the heavenly places, you can't handle these little disputes. I mean, come on. Verse 3, how much more things that pertain to this life? Now watch this. Verse 4, if then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, 
set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. He's, say, he's not saying there are people who are least esteemed in the eyes of God. He says, pick the person that you esteem the least, that maybe the, the newbie or whatever. Just let them judge it. That's, this, that's how much all this little temporal stuff is worth. Let them make the judgment. Verse number five. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? Isn't that what the doctrine is supposed to produce wisdom? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. Now, verse six and seven. Y'all sitting down? Yeah, here we go. But brother, go up to law with brother. And that before the who? Larry mentioned Judge Judy. One day, Judge Judy, she had a family before her, the plaintiffs and, and the defendant. And I think it was a brother suing a brother or a son suing his mother. And Judge Judy looked at the case. She couldn't believe it. You know, she's got the bailiff there, Bird. She said, Bird, read that. I can't read that. Man. Is this right? You're suing your family member? She was so upset, and she should. Why are you suing your family member? Well, look at this. But brother go up to bro uh, law, uh, uh, with a brother, and that before the unbelievers. Oh, man. Verse 7. Now, therefore, there is utter utterly a fault among you. Because you go to law one with another, why do you not just rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong and defraud, and that's your brother. Paul says, you guys are so dumb to be having these stupid little petty things anyway, but then you take them to court and before a bunch of unjust, lost unbelievers. How stupid is that? You defraud your brother, the righteous judge. Go over to 1 Thessalonians. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Satan is, boy, he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a subtle, rascally little devil because he's got people not understanding what the Lord is, the term, and who the Lord is, the person. This word Lord, remember we went back to Genesis? Check this out. In Genesis chapter 1, Genesis 1, he's called God. You can check it out in your own time. Mm -hmm. In Genesis chapter 2, as he's preparing the earth for man, he calls, he, he's called the Lord God. Now you say, wait a minute. God is God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why did God change the narrative to the Lord God? Because once man hits the, the earth, there's going to be some judgment, some judging. He's going to make judgments. And that's what that term is, the righteous judge. Look at, uh, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, if you will. Verse number 1. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by... Now look, he exhorts by the Lord Jesus. Paul's, when Paul says, by the Lord Jesus, anytime your mind sees Paul write that word, Lord, just think he's talking about judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. And he says, I'm going to motivate you by the Lord, the righteous judge and the judgment seat of Christ. Watch this. That as ye have received of us, that's Paul, Timotheus and Silas, how you ought to walk and to please God. Today, to know how to please God, you got to listen to the apostle Paul. That's why you have to rightly divide the word of truth, because Paul's epistles teach the body of Christ how to please God. Look at verse one. So ye would abound more and more for ye know. Verse two, Paul calls them what commandments we gave you. Not by Christ, by judge. not by Jesus, not by the he calls them Lord Jesus, because he's focusing on the when Paul gives commandments, where are these commandments going to be? <coughs> Where, where is he going to judge whether we did what he said to do at the judgment seat of Christ? OK, now keep going. Verse three, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. After you're saved, God wants you to be sanctified. A process of being set apart unto God for his use. That's through the word of God, right? That ye should abstain from fornication. That every one of you should uh, know how to possess his vessel. That's your physical body in sanctification and honor. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. That's how the heathen 
who don't know God walk. Now look at verse 6, everybody. That no man go beyond and what? Defraud his brother in any matter. Remember Paul says they're defrauding one another? A, to, to fraud is, a defraud is taking something from them that's rightfully there. Watch this. Because that the Lord, now when you, when you see the Lord, what do your mind supposed to think? Right. The righteous judge is the what? Avenger. That word avenger means he takes revenge. Um, we won't see it today, but just look up avenger. It's the avenger of blood in the Old Testament. It was the family member who, by law, was able to go and kill you for killing their family member. It was a lawful law of Moses prescribed judgment on a murderer. The family, the, the family member of the, of the murdered party gets to kill the murderer of their family member. That was called the avenger of blood. The Lord uses that same term to describe him at the judgment seat of Christ. I want you to see this is no joke, this judgment seat of Christ. He will avenge you. Look at this. The avenger of all such as we have also what? Forewarned you and testified. Paul is given a, a warning. Warning, warning. When I was a little boy, maybe I'm making this up. Was there something where a little thing goes, Moses warning, warning? Because uh, you was watching it. That's how I know it. Huh? <laughs> My mother. Warning, 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 warning. Ro was it called Will Rums? Will Rums? Anyway, I just remember I was a little boy. I see some robot going, warning, warning, warning. That's what Paul is doing. He's warning us. It's like that goofy robot on a planet. I don't know. I thought I was, but maybe I did see that as a little boy. Lost in space. Well, it was this robot, and he's a warning, warning, warning. That's what Paul is doing. He's trying to warn you. The judgment seat of Christ, the reason why you don't hear about it, Satan doesn't want you to heed that warning. This is real deal. The Lord, okay, watch this. Go back to 2 Corinthians, the judgment seat of Christ. Look at it. Look at 2 Corinthians, chapter 5. If you like Bible numerics like I do, numbers in the Bible, God's a mathematician. God deals with numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, forty, one hundred. The number ten, like the Ten Commandments, is associated with judgment. In fact, the term the, the term judgment seat, like that, is mentioned ten times in the King James Bible. The, the Ten Commandments are called the judgments of God. In 2 Corinthians 5, which verse you probably think. Well, verse 10, by the way, in Romans chapter 14, what verse you probably think? Verse 10, yeah, he mentions the judgment seat of Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 and start at verse 9 for context. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9. Wherefore we labor, this has to do with our labor in the Lord, that whether present, that's present in our body, or absent, absent from our body, present with the Lord, we may be accepted of him. Now, now, I want you to understand, this has nothing to do with your salvation. Okay? For your soul from hell. Sins. Your salvation from your, with, of your soul from hell. Because, soul from hell. Because we know that Ephesians tells us we are accepted in the beloved, right? Mm -hmm. So positionally, our justification, uh, we are accepted. That's our position before God because of Calvary. So the moment you get saved, God accepts you in Christ forever, positionally. But it's more than just position. It's your practice that God cares about too, right? After you're saved. It's more than just your salvation. It's your sanctification. We just saw that in 1 Thessalonians 4. He says, even this is the will of God, even your sanctification. So after you're saved... Which Toby, you may, I love Toby. He was sitting there last couple weeks ago, maybe. And he says, you can't serve God without having that salvation settled first. Remember that, Toby? I forgot he said, you always do. That's right. It's, it's the liberty you have. You can't really serve God until you know you're saved, right? Too many people spend years wondering if they're saved because they haven't lived the, the right life that the preacher told them or what they got in their mind or whatever, even what the scriptures say. 
They don't even know. I get preachers call me, Brother Ron, I think I committed the unpardonable sin. I say, oh, boy. What pulpit you in, man? You better get out right now. Get out. Get out. You're messing people up. Get out. Then we'll talk. No. You're saved forever. You have eternal security. What God and Paul now want you to do is grow in your sanctification, your practice. Now, in your practice, you want to be acceptable. Paul says, right? Yeah, he, you want that, but not everybody will get that. Now, look, look at verse number nine, Second Corinthians five. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him for verse 10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Yeah. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he have done, whether it be good or bad. Now, people, in, even in dispensational circles who don't understand the difference between, look, man, the tools. Context is one of the tools, the first tool in every study. But part of your study, you always have to divide justification from sanctification. Because this is not something that Christ, this is not about Christ working in you per se. Uh, this is your faith working. Because Christ doesn't, look at the end of that verse. According to what he have done, whether it be good or bad. Does the Lord Jesus Christ wrought any bad in you? No. Paul says in Galatians, our Galatians study on Wednesday, he said, If while being just seeking to be justified by Christ, I myself are, are, are become a sinner, is Christ therefore the minister of sin? He says, God forbid. Don't blame Jesus Christ for the bad. This is what we do, our, our faith, what, excuse me, our choices. The faithful choices would be good. The unfaithful choice would be bad. At the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to have to deal with the good and the bad. You ever talk to a lost person and you say, are you going to heaven when you die? They say, I hope so. Bro. I hope so, Ron. I say, how are you going to get there? Well, I just hope God looks. I'm not that bad of a person. You know, I haven't killed nobody. <laughs> Maybe I got some good works. I've been feeding the homeless down there, Sacramento. I say, basically, you just want him to weigh your good and bad, right? And hopefully your good outweighs your bad. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I go, you're dead. You're going to hell. <laughs> wow. Because you got to be perfect. That's right. No, when God weighs good and bad, that's for the believer. That's, that's how he, in our study, that's how he weighs our works. But for a lost person, they need to get in through Jesus Christ our Lord, through the cross. Because in order to go to heaven, you have to be perfect. I don't care how much good you do. Is your good going to outweigh Jesus Christ's good? No. No. The, the weighing of good and bad, that's a sanctification reward issue at the judgment seat of Christ. See, he's going to weigh good or bad. No, look at that. Whether it be good or bad. Now, because of that, Paul spent a lot of time, most of his time, motivating people by the judgment seat of Christ. He's, when he says, by the Lord Jesus, it's the judgment seat of Christ. Look at the next verse. Knowing, therefore, the kindness of the Lord. Know, knowing therefore the love of Jesus. No, no, no. He used a word. Terror. Terror. You know why the Old Testament calls it the great and notable, great and terrible day of the Lord? It puts fear in your hearts. And Paul is saying, when Paul says in Philippians, work out your own salvation with what? Fear and trembling, Philippians 2, he means that. He means don't take this life in Christ you have lightly. Don't play around with it. Listen, look what verse 11 says. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. I've heard people say, they mess up verse 10 by saying this. I've had brothers in the Lord. I love and know, but they got it wrong. They say, see, that, that verse 10, that's, the, that's just about, you know, what Jesus produces in you. Jesus don't produce bad in you. And then they go on to say, in verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Oh, he's not talking to saved people. He's talking to the lost people. No, he's not. Paul said, what do I have to do with, with the lost? God judges the lost. We have to judge this with, within. Paul is talking to saved people. There's not going to be any lost people at the judgment seat of Christ. This is only for who? The body of Christ, believers. 
Where lost people appear is way out here at the great white throne judgment. Yeah, that's where the lost appear. At the judgment seat of Christ, these are saved people, the body of Christ, believers in, in Christ. And we're going to be judged. There's a terror associated with that. Okay? Remember the, what Paul says when he uses terror in Romans 13? For rulers are not a terror to good works but to evil. He's going to judge. E Look at this. Okay. Before we go to Romans, before we go to Romans and look at that judgment seat, go over with me to, oh boy, I just forgot it already. I got too many verses rolling around in my head. Oh man, we'll get to it. Oh, it's going to be a good part. Anyway, that's all right. I'll, I'll, it'll come back to me. Um, terror of the Lord. We are there for man. Oh, Colossians 3. Go to Colossians 3. It's not in my notes, but I just can't. Colossians 3. Look at Colossians 3. Now, I want you to see something. Look at verse 24 and 25, okay? You ever notice in your, your study of the Bible that you can read the book of Ephesians? And then if you go, do it, do it this week. Read Ephesians, then read the Colossians. And you'll say, Paul just mentioned that same thing in Ephesians. <laughs> Ephesians and then Colossians. Now, most people call them sister epistles, right? Sister epistles, because you could see that they got a lot of the same Ephesians and Colossians. It'll, it'd be like he's saying very similar things. By the way, God does that because to understand something in Ephesians, just read the, its corresponding Colossians and vice versa. But mostly this is the real reason God does that. Ephesians focus. Every book has a focus, a theme. The theme of Ephesians is God, the father. So God, the father's. God the Father's view of his children who are his heirs. So the focus of Ephesians is God's look and love. It's just got this flowery way that he talks to his children like I talk to my seven-year-old. But Colossians' view is how the joint heirs, his, his, his children who are grown up, view the head. Joint heirs uh, view the Christ as the head, the Lord. Okay, so this one is like from up there down. This is looking up. This one is for the heirs of God. This one's for the joint heirs. This is all the body, and this one is the focus is the faithful. Okay, but not only are they not just sister epistles, because Philippians is right in there. Philippians is between them. Ephesians, Colossians, they are spousal epistles. They're closer than just sisters, their husband, wife. Ephesians focus on the church as the body. Colossians focus on Christ as the head. That's the wife. This is the husband. So it's all of these different things when you look at them. It says similar things, but the viewpoint is different. Colossians focuses on, are you serving the Lord? Colossians, Ephesians focus on, are you saved? Yep, you're saved. Colossians, are you sanctified? Now, I want to show you something in Colossians chapter 3, verse number 23. Colossians 3, 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily. Now, over in Ephesians, it says, with all your heart. That's what heartily means, with all your heart. Here we go. As to the Lord. Lord means what? Just look at my title. And not unto men. The motivation. You're not serving men. You're serving the righteous judge. Knowing. Why do you have that in your mind? Knowing that of the who? The righteous judge. Ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Now watch this. He didn't say you're going to receive the inheritance. You already got that. When you got saved, you became an heir of God. God has given you an inheritance. But there is a reward of the inheritance. And what the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the head, he's reigning. Okay? So when you're serving him in the truth, you're going to reign with him. Watch this. The reward of the inheritance, for, for means further explanation, ye serve, watch this, the Lord Christ. He uses both terms. You serve the righteous judge who suffered. And if you serve the righteous judge who suffered, 
and you suffer for the righteous judge, you're going to receive his reward. It's his, this is his reward. It's his reward. Jesus Christ is the king of kings and Lord of Lords. You're going to reign with him, but you got to serve him in the mystery. But you got a choice. God gives us free will, volition. God is not going to make you serve him. Now, what happens? You choose. Hey, I don't want to serve the Lord. Uh, hold your hand there and go back to Second Timothy. Go back to Second Timothy. <coughs> there are going to be some people who who part of that denying to chapter two, verse 12. Look at look at chapter two, verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. But because we have free will choice, God's not going to make you do it so you can deny him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. So he's going to say, OK, you get the judgment seat of Christ. You didn't want to reign. You didn't you didn't want to uh, you didn't want to suffer in my truth. Fine. You didn't want to sit at that little church over there in Sacramento County. You had 10 people on a day. On a Wednesday, 20 on a thing. Okay, fine. Because of what it looks like, fine, fine. You want to go and be in that? Okay, good, good, good. You don't want to suffer in the truth. That's fine. You won't reign with me. I'll deny you reign. Now, thankfully, he's not like in prophecy where, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out devils in your name? And, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? He's going to say, depart from me, you that work iniquity. I never knew. Angels put them in, the, put them in the, um, the, the everlasting fire. He won't send us to hell. Look at the next verse. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.13, if we believe not, let's say you get saved and you don't care about the word of God, yet he abideth what? Faithful. He cannot deny himself. You are a member of his body. Ephesians 5 says we're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. He cannot deny himself. You won't lose your salvation. You'll lose reward. Go back to Colossians. We got a couple of minutes. Look at Colossians chapter 3 verse 25. The Lord is going to check out and see if you've done good or bad. He's going to weigh it out. See where the scale is. Verse 25. But he that doeth what? Wrong. Shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there's no respect of persons. At the judgment seat of Christ... You're going to receive for the wrong which you have done. Now, there's some good news. He always gives space to repent. We won't go to it today, but 2 Corinthians 7, you can read it on your own. That's how a believer repents today. So those, so those wrongs won't go to the judgment seat. Paul says you'll be cleared of the wrongdoing. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an extensive process. Okay. <coughs> now, now, two other verses. Go to Romans chapter 14, Romans 14, the, the other time, the judgment seat of Christ. By the way, just I want to say this. The judgment seat of Christ is only mentioned by name two times like that. But it's in every passage of Paul's epistles, the concept. Paul's sole motivation was the judgment seat of Christ. Pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. He says you run the race. And in those Olympic games, remember what we saw? The reason the Olympics are held every four years, there were four cities in Greece and they would hold those Greco-Roman games in each of the cities every year. And so it would take four years for it to get back. So it'd be in this city, the next year in that city, the next year in that city, that city, and then it come back to city number one. So it was, that's where we get that whole four year thing for the Olympics that come from the Grecians. But part of those Greco-Roman games, when you ran that race, the judgment seat the judge's seat was down the course. And what the men did, they ran toward, they, when, they, when, they, when they said they got the starting line, the guys looked down there, there's the judge right there in the judgment seat. And they ran towards him. And whoever got to him first received the prize. Whoever got to him second and third, you know. They were running towards the judgment seat. That's how Paul says we ought to run, towards the judgment seat. Paul did, okay? Look at Romans 14.10. Romans 14, 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set, thou set it not thy brother? 
For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's you and me in the body. You know, you don't hear this a lot in, in denominations. In fact, how many denominations, when you were in denomination church, how often did the preacher even mention the judgment seat of Christ? Probably hardly ever. Because if you're in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels, the judgment seat of Christ is not mentioned there. It's only in Paul's epistles. Verse 11, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, saith the Lord, the righteous judge, and every tongue shall confess to God, so then every one of us, that includes you and me. Think about that. You, just think, I am going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ all along. I'm going to, there's his great, by the way, it is a, a white throne, by the way. He always on a great white throne. Anyway, but it's not the great white throne judgment. This is the judgment seat of Christ. He's going to be sitting there in all his glory, and we're going to be like this, just right before him. We're going to bow down. He's going to say, get up, and yes, Lord, and here it go. And everybody going to be watching. That's a scary proposition. The motives of your hearts, your motivations for doing everything, your actions, your words, your thoughts, all out there. Ain't that scary? Yeah. Watch this. Whew. <laughs> so then every one of us, verse 12, shall give account to himself to God. There's, this stuff is going to the judgment seat of Christ. Let's end in 1 first, first Timothy chapter number 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Now again, God is gracious and he's not trying to pound anybody in the body of Christ. I got, I got, we're going to end in one more. Yep, we got two minutes. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. So go to 1 Timothy 5. I, I always want to end on God's grace with the saints. Now, if you lost and you're watching this on YouTube, you're gonna, I got a message for you because you're in trouble. You're in tr you can't just be lost living your life, not worried about dying. You're that close to a Christless eternity. And I don't want you to go to hell, so I'm going to give you a message. But for saints, look at 1 Timothy chapter number 5, verse number 24. Some men's sins... 1 Timothy 5, 24. Some men's sins, this is the body of Christ, are open beforehand, going before to judgment. So there are some sins that saints commit. Did you say, that's bad, like the guy in 1 Corinthians 5. He had his father's wife. I know the Lord not happy with that. Everybody know that. But what if he did that in secret and nobody saw it? Well, <laughs> and some men, they follow after. Even though we don't see it, the Lord is watching, and he's going to bring it out in the open. And that's, that's crazy. He, he sees the stuff in secret. But, but look at the opposite is true, too. Look at verse 25. Likewise, also the what? Good works of some are manifest beforehand. There's some people in the body you can say, that is a person, that's a sister or brother who is serving the Lord Jesus. You can see it. I know they're going to have a great reward. But there are people who are serving the Lord just as much, and we don't know about it. I always tell you, as we come to the end, we had a brother in the Lord named Mike back in Minnesota. We had our ministry seven there, years there. And then before that, I was in Chicago seven years before we moved here five and a half years ago. And um, unbeknownst to anybody, to prepare for Sunday service, he'd come after work or after doing his work on Saturday. And at Saturday night, to prepare the, the, the church, he'd clean the whole church. He'd, he'd bring a buffer. He'd, he didn't tell a soul. I just happened to one day go, I left something there and I needed it for Sunday. So I, I went down to the church, opened the door to get this and leave. And there's Brother Mike buffing the floor. And I said, what you doing? I said, thanks, Mike. He goes, oh, I do this every, every Saturday night. Nobody knew. The Lord knew. If I hadn't done that, we would have got the judgment seat and God would have did that. And I go, I didn't even know that. I was the pastor of the church. I didn't know he was doing it. He didn't say a word because he was doing it as unto the Lord. But that was just, see that? Verse 25, likewise also the good works of some are manifest beforehand. That wasn't Mike until I found out. And they that are otherwise, which aren't manifest, cannot be hid. That man would have, no man would have known he did that, but the Lord would have revealed it at the judgment seat of Christ, okay? Let's end over in 1 Corinthians 4. 1 Corinthians 4. I got some good news for the people who... Maybe you feel like you haven't redeemed the time properly. Well, that's all of us. 
quite frankly, none of us should have the confidence Paul had at the end of his life until the Lord told him. We all should be saying, you know what, I could do more. But God is gracious. Verse number five. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. This is a good place to end. Therefore, judge nothing before the time. What time? Until the righteous judge come. That's the rapture, where we go to the judgment seat. The rapture is what takes, most people look at the rapture as getting us out here before the wrath, getting us out of this crazy, sin-cursed world. It is. It's a beautiful thing. But it's really the vehicle that takes us to the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? So when the Lord come, who will, get this, who will both bring to light the what types of things of darkness? Hidden things of darkness. You ain't getting away with nothing. And will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. He's going to mo- he's going to see what motivated you to do what you did. Because you could do good things with the wrong motivation. He reading your meter. Oh, man. But at the end, at the end, this is coming off the passage where Paul says there's gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay and stubble. Let's say you had that wood, hay and stubble. Even at the end, God is gracious. Let's end right here. Verse five. And then. Shall every man have what of God? Praise Praise God. At the end of that judgment seat, when we hand it over to God the Father, without spot or wrinkle, any such thing, and and you may not reign with Christ because you wasted your life, but God the Father is going to say, now, you're going to be part of every name that is named. I got something for you. You didn't do a thing to serve your Lord, my son, during your sojourn there, but that's okay. One day you decided to trust my son as your savior, and that that was a good choice. That was the best choice, the only good choice you ever made in your life. But you you got saved, and I'm happy. Imagine, you could do nothing for the Lord, and the God, the Father, would say, you know what? It was a wasted life. You knew better. He read your heart. You knew better. But you did trust him one day of your life. And that qualifies you to be in my kingdom. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You're going you're gonna to open the gates of heaven. You kept telling people, all that matters if we get to heaven. All that matters if I hold up the gates of heaven. Now you're going to do that. Go hold the gates of heaven open for everybody else. No, nah, he ain't going to do that. They ain't just going to do that. He's going to have you sweeping up behind those fiery horses or something. You know. <laughs> Take care of the barn. You know what I think he's going to do. We got to end. Be very careful how you treat other brethren. Because I look at the Bible, how God does things, I got sneaky suspicion as people attack their brethren, especially those who are in the grace message, and mock them and stuff, no doubt God's going to turn them tables and have the, the very ones they're attacking be over them. And they're going to spend the rest of everlasting serving their brethren. The very ones they've been mocking and stuff, they're going to be like under them. Think about that. Think about that. He's going to vindicate people who have been attacked wrongfully. He's going to avenge them. And he's going to humble those who have, in their pride, in their, in their, in their pompousness, attacked them. It, God's going to flip. He always flips the tables on you, okay? Remember that. Oh, yeah. And if you're, if you're not saved today, if you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, now's the time. God's will is that all men be saved and come into knowledge of the truth. Salvation is full and free in Jesus Christ, our Lord. He died on the cross to give you that salvation. Why don't you trust him? No works. And if you are saved, God wants you to learn the rightly divided word, understanding Paul's doctrine and rightly divided from God's prophetic program with the nation of Israel. Our ministry is here to teach you that. Now, we ain't going to get a lot of people in these last days of grace to believe it. But that makes it even more important for those who, of us who do. God is looking for some people to reign with Christ. and He wants it to be us. So if you love that mystery and you, you prove it by serving God, by serving your brothers and sisters in Christ in the mystery, you can wake up every day saying, I know I'm going to reign with Christ, okay? And we'll help you with that. All right, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. We thank you that we can get into your holy word each and every day. But more importantly, that we have this ministry where we can come together with those of like precious faith, both new and old, both uh, um, those who've been with us, visitors, and, and, and those who are new to the internet ministry, we thank you that we can come together and hear your preaching of your holy word, Father. There's nothing better than the dynamic of teaching and preaching, particularly in person, 
of your truth. We thank you for that. Father, as we have our Q&A, as we go about our day today, we ask that you uh, bless our time together. Uh, we, we ask that the things that we learn from your holy word take root in our hearts and bring forth the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ our Lord, to the praise and glory of you, Father. Let us believe the things that we learn from your holy scripture, your holy word, and put them into practice. We, we thank you in the name of your son, the precious Savior, the Lord Jesus.